I'm Allie. I'm the content strategist <laughs> for uh, CallStats.io, and this is Carl. Carl Bloom, Director of Marketing for CallStats. And we're here to talk to you about the relationship between call quality and network topology. So a little bit about call stats. Um, we were founded in 2014 by IETF and W3C author authors. This includes um, one of the co-authors of the GetStats API, who is our CEO. Um, we have customers across multiple verticals, including contact centers, team collaboration, and more. And what we do is we measure and manage the performance of real-time multimedia communications. So we collect over 1 billion WebRTC data points each month. And um, we're able to segregate that data based on network topology, which gives us insights into which topologies work better than others and some of the trade-offs bet between topologies. We're integrated into leading CPaaS platforms like Amazon Connect, Twilio, and TalkBox, and also SDKs like Jitsi and Frozen Mountain. And we're backed by leading venture capital firms as well. So where the WebRTC industry is today, uh, Microsoft Windows is the most dominant platform on the market. Google Chrome, of course, is the most dominant browser, and 70% of WebRTC sessions are peer-to-peer. -peer. Of course, um, the fewer the participants, the higher the audio and the video quality. Um, we gather all this data and compile it into a metrics report, which we put out fairly regularly, available for free on our website. So a couple indicators of call quality that we really care about are round trip time and objective quality. Round trip time is the time it takes for a packet to go from the sending endpoint to the receiving endpoint and back. This includes the processing delay, the queuing delay, transmission, and propagation delay. We also really care about objective quality, which is actually a proprietary metric that we've developed, which is a combination of jitter, throughput, delay, and other WebRTC metrics to measure call quality. And it's a, we consider it to be a much better indicator of call quality than just user feedback, which can be very subjective. So now I'm going to give it over to Carl to talk a little bit about the different topologies. Great. OK, thank you. So we've been talking a lot about topologies tonight. So some of this is just a quick refresher. So WebRTC, of course, by nature, peer-to-peer. -peer, when you have more than two uh, participants, you create a mesh of uh, peers. And, um, and those, the peer networks produce the best quality in terms of latency, lowest delay. Um, as we add topology into the network, uh, sorry, as we add infrastructure into the network, um, we start to increase delay. And so this is uh, pretty uh, self-explanatory. Um, on the picture on the left, we have uh, Alice and Bob. Alice is behind a strict enterprise firewall. She needs a turn service to communicate with Bob. Um, so the turn service is introduced and uh, adds some delay. Um, and when you go to the mesh uh, topology, Alice continues to need um, a turn service. And uh, that provides the relay to both Bob and Carol. Bob and Carol, though, however, do not need a turn service. They can communicate directly because they are outside of that firewall. We go to the right, and things get just a little bit more complicated. Um, here we have a bridge, and uh, that could be uh, an MCU or an SFU, as was described by some of the earlier presenters. And uh, the bridge is providing uh, the relay of the media between the participants. Um, this helps to reduce the amount of bandwidth consumed um, on the network and provides better performance for the participants, offloads the, the uh, endpoints from doing a lot of the media processing that would otherwise be required in the full mesh. So the trade-off is uh, bandwidth for, uh, for, for media processing. So now let's look at some of the performance characteristics. So first we'll um, compare uh, round trip time, which Allie explained uh, is the time for a packet to traverse the network and come back to its origin. Um, round trip time for the three different scenarios that we talked about earlier. And this is leveraging the data that we have in our database um, across all of our customers. As Ali mentioned, a billion data points uh, analyzed per month. So we've got a lot of data here um, across lots of different applications uh, deployed in all types of geographies around the world. Um, what you're seeing is that point-to-point -point uh, pr provides very good uh, round-trip time performance. And as we move towards the bridge, 
the bridge actually increases uh, latency significantly or around trip time. Um, in fact, the median values are roughly double from point to point to a bridge configuration. So the bridge adds significant latency, doubles the latency on median. Um, the turn graph, um, on the other hand, is kind of a, an interesting graph because it starts off um, closely paralleling uh, point to point and then starts to move over towards the bridge as we get more and more uh, data points into the analysis. And uh, for turn, what we're, we believe here is that these turn servers are actually located geographically in different um, uh, places than the bridge servers, and in fact, for many of the participants in the conferences, that those turn servers are actually very close geographically to the participants in the conference. So now let's look at um, some RTT data, and this is going to be for intercontinental um, versus, uh, sorry, intercontinental versus domestic in U.S. and Canada. And so uh, we have on the top graph, we have uh, data for calls that um, originate in the United States. The blue line, those calls are also terminated in the United States. And the red line, those calls are all originated in the United States but terminate outside of the United States. So you can see that as we move from domestic to intercontinental calling, significant round trip time added. Um, in fact, that's roughly, uh, I believe, double um, for the 95th percentile of, uh, of calls here, um, double the amount of latency in the, in the median. Um, Canada is kind of interesting here. Um, we have fewer data points in Canada, number one, so that's why the curve isn't quite as smooth. Um, and the other interesting thing is that uh, we believe that a lot of these Canadian calls are actually coming to the United States, um, where the latency or round trip time is probably significantly less. So, uh, so the, the curves are actually a little bit closer together than what you would have for the U.S. calls. But nonetheless, you can see that um, domestic versus international, um, huge differences in round trip time. Now let's look uh, using the OQ metric that we talked about earlier. Ali introduced that as our, our own proprietary metric for um, estimating the user's actual experience with media on each of the endpoints. Um, so objective quality factors together many, many different characteristics that we're getting out of those endpoints, delay, latency, jitter, and um, uh, rolls them all together to uh, create an estimate that we believe actually tracks very closely to what users are actually experiencing. Um, OQ is measured on a score of one to three. Um, so three is good, one, uh, one is not so good, and zero is really not very good. Um, and so you have on the left-hand side continental calls, and you can see that the cluster of data is very close to the center. Um, so uh, actually the performance here is between one and two, which is uh, for the, for the uh, majority of the participants in those calls, which is actually pretty good. Um, intercontinental, on the other hand, you can see that uh, the data is skewed much more towards the low end. We're getting lots of zeros and, and uh, sub-one scores. Uh, for that data. So here again, we're emphasizing intercontinental versus domestic, much big difference in, uh, in quality of media. So we talked about all that uh, topology stuff for a reason, and that's because hair pinning is a big deal. Um, hair pinning has to do with um, your network topology and where you place those boxes that are in the center of your, di of your network diagram, the SFUs, the MCUs, the bridges, and the turn servers. They're all relaying media, so um, sending media through those devices um, uh, puts your media on a detour from its ultimate destination. And the better location you have for those devices, um, closer to all the participants, the better performance you're going to get. So um, you can see here the illustration on the, on the right-hand side. Um, the blue box is better than the yellow box. Now, we found that as we analyzed our data, hairpinning was really evident in a lot of Asian countries. Um, uh, all of the, uh, uh, the uh, graphs on the left-hand side, with the one, two, three, four, five bars on the left-hand side, um, all of those countries had local uh, um, servers uh, for handling media. 
Um, so the hairpinning was significantly reduced. All the Asian countries shown on the right-hand side boxes, uh, significantly higher RTT, and that is a result of hairpinning and essentially sending media um, out of country, transcontinental or uh, certainly transoceanic uh, to remote locations where they find their turn server and then most times are returning back to that country after they get, uh, get through that server. This piece of data actually talks about multi-party. So um, here we see the effects of multi-party conferences on media quality. So this again uses our OQ score, um, objective quality, and uh, instead though, um, a little bit of a curveball for you, um, the X scale is showing you variation in quality. So the lower the number here, actually the better. Um, and the higher the number, the more variability was found in the objective quality scores for all of these calls. Um, and so you can see on the left-hand side, we're looking at audio objective quality measurements, um, and on the right-hand side, video. Again, audio on the left-hand side, objective quality is uh, performing much better for the calls with three participants and the calls with 12 or more participants um, had very bad distributions up, uh, you know, high variability in the distributions of the objective quality scores. And very similar on the right-hand side with video. So video and audio were affected equally by a number of participants that were involved in a call. Uh, pulling this all together, some, some takeaways. First off, use peer-to-peer -peer whenever possible. Um, produces the best performance, the best latency, and the best media quality. Um, locate your, your servers, your turn servers, your bridges close to your users. And if you're running a, a global service, that means you've got to put servers in a lot of places. Um, put them in Asia, you've got to put them in, in Europe, in South America, North America, obviously. Maintain low RTT for your inter intercontinental call, so, so watch the RTT values, and then use objective quality to evaluate your multi-party call quality. And that is really a good metric. It allows you to look closely at um, the per participant obje objective quality. Um, so one of the tricky parts about multi-party is that um, one party's experience can degrade all the other party's experiences. And that's not immediately evident um, if you're looking at other metrics. Objective quality gives you the ability to expose the, the different effects that one party can have on the experience of all the parties in the, in the conference and quickly evaluate that.